The 6 o'clock news starts right now. All right, so now it's time to bring the party inside. We're tracking loud storms moving through the San Antonio area on this Memorial Day. Let's get straight over to meteorologist Sarah Spivey tracking the latest. Sarah? Thank you. Yes, we are seeing these scattered storms moving into San Antonio as we speak. Now, these storms are are scattered in nature, so there are those that are missing out and those that are getting torrential downpours. Yes, there may be some small pea-sized hail to penny-sized hail, and we've seen that in areas in northwestern Bear County up to Bernie. But the biggest thing here is how heavy, heavy the rain is falling. In fact, up to two to four inches of rain has already fallen in parts of northwestern Bear County, parts of Kendall County and Bandera County. This is where we've got flash flood warning in effect until 745 this evening as all of the water, even though it's starting to get a little bit lighter up in these areas, all of that rainwater has to run off. So flash flood warning continues for those areas until 745. I'm going to turn off the lightning and the warnings here just so that I can show you where the heaviest of the rain is falling right now from Chavano Park down to Churchill High School, Castle Hills area, just getting close to Lee High School in Alamo Heights on the west side of San Antonio to Leon Valley, Holmes High School, John Jay high school area, SeaWorld area, uh, and just now starting to push toward McDonough. You can see that these areas east of 281 are really not seeing as much rain as the areas west of 281, and these are very slow moving system. We're talking about moving to the southeast at about 20, 15 to 20 miles per hour. So if they were to hold on, they would make it to areas uh, in southern Bear County such as, let's see, let me scoot over a little bit so that we can see a little better, such as the Pearl by 603, uh, Lone Star area by 605, South Sand High School area by about 605 as well. We've also got some heavy rain falling near Hondo too. And I don't want to forget parts of the hill country, storminess out near Lakey as well, and further to the south and to the east, some isolated showers and storms near Hallettsville. I'm going to have a more detailed look at the radar, how much rain has fallen, and when and we can expect this rain to end coming up in just a bit. Sarah, thank you. Back to Memorial Day today. Grieving families want their communities to remember the actual true meaning of Memorial Day, and that's loss, gratitude, and healing. Brigadier General Terrence Hildner was the second highest ranking American off officer to pass away while he was serving in Afghanistan. His wife, Sydney Hildner, lives here in San Antonio and has served as a civilian in the military for 40 years. She sat down with Courtney Friedman to talk about how service has defined her life and aided in her healing. Terry loved being a soldier. It was the thing that he enjoyed the most. Um, he was known as a soldier's soldier. Cindy Hildner said her husband, Brigadier General Terrence Hildner, was known for his enthusiasm, dedication, and compassion. He loved training soldiers. He, that's what he's known for. He was a forward thinker. Um, he insisted on training for everybody. And he took that expertise to war, fighting in desert storms, serving twice in Iraq and once in Afghanistan, where he died February 3rd, 2012, of an aortic aneurysm. I was married to an incredible person, and not just because he was a soldier or an officer or a general officer. Um, I mean, he was a good person. I mean, he had a kind soul. After his death, Cindy said she was in a fog and her first wave of relief came months into her grief when she helped support another widow. I realized that I needed to help others because I got so much by helping her. She helped me. I thought this is the way you this is the path to heal. From there, she got involved with organizations that help military and Gold Star families, like Tuesday's Children, which started as an organization to help families of 9-11 first responders. They put on these retreats, and they also do other things like um, sponsor game, uh, games, like basketball games, football games, hockey. She hopes other Gold Star families will reach out for support, and she hopes the public will think about these families and remember that Memorial Day isn't just about barbecues and the start of summer. And it's wonderful to celebrate all that, but also celebrate the fact that you can do that because of those who lost their life um, trying to defend the freedom that we hold so dear. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News.
Today, we also took a moment to send off high school students to service academies this summer. The send off was held this afternoon at the Freeman Expo Hall. U.S. Senator John Cornyn hosted that event. Around 100 academy bound students and their families attended today's ceremony. And we just wanted to take a moment to say that we are proud of them and wish them luck. This is really a bright spot of my year because, as I said, these young people are really the cream of the crop. They've worked awfully hard. They're very disciplined, and uh, they are, I think, uh, going to be uh, the next generation of our leaders. General James Rainey was the event's keynote speaker. He is the commanding general of U.S. Army Futures Command in Austin. And this Memorial Day ceremony was held today at the Vietnam War Memorial over at Edgewood Stadium. It is said that Edgewood Independent School District has the national distinction of suffering the highest number of Latino casualties in the Vietnam War. Amelda Delgado's brother Chris was among the Edgewood 55 who didn't make it back home. Jesse Degollado tells us attending ceremonies like the one today isn't the only way Delgado honors her brother. I mean, you'd have to know him. He was just one of a kind. One of a kind, and perhaps like Chris Delgado's like devoted him. younger sister. Even though I have enough, I'll buy more. That rack of clothing. Just anything that has red, white, and blue. Is only some of what she's worn almost every Friday to honor her 21-year-old Navy brother. He was killed when his boat was hit by rocket fire during the 1968 Tet Offensive. It does me good to honor him because he was such a good person, so loving, and people loved him so much, and um, I wanted to do something to honor him. And all the scarves, friends have given me the scarves. Imelda Delgado says her red, white, and blue collection started when she worked at USAA, wearing red on Fridays to honor the troops. Just when you thought she had anything and everything possible in red, white, and blue, someone gave her a red, white, and blue rosary. People think of me that way. They help add to her array of patriotic pins, jewelry of all kinds, shoes, purses, even a dainty red, white, and blue fan, and other mementos. Delgado thinks her brother would probably say she doesn't have to do all this. But, sorry, I'm gonna do it. We get to live in a free land and they gave that to us. Delgado urges others to do what they can in remembrance of those like her beloved brother, and not just on Memorial Day. Because if it weren't for them, we wouldn't have this country. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Take a look now at other stories we've been following today. San Antonio police shot a man on the near north side this morning while responding to a disturbance call at a rundown vacant home. So here's the thing. Nobody was hit, but the incident has drawn attention to what Garrett Berger tells us is an infamous home in that neighborhood. From out in the street, you can see this is a pretty rundown house, and one neighbor tells us the doors have even been off for about a month now. But there was someone here today. A neighbor told us she saw a man yelling and banging what she thought was a machete on a neighbor's fence. After her husband called police, she looked out and saw him in the street with a weapon and shouting again. When officers arrived, police say he pointed a shotgun at them. Though the officers fired at the man, no one was hit and he was arrested. I saw him jump out the window and um, the officers apprehended him. Looking in the house, there appears to be a, a bit of stolen property, what appears to be stolen property. The house appears to be abandoned, and neighbors say people come and go. One neighbor says the man had been there every day since Friday, though there hadn't been anyone for a month or more before that. The police chief says they plan to get the city's dangerous assessment response team, or DART, involved. It's not clear exactly what the future for this property will be, but we did see a dangerous premises officer from Development Services out here taking photos. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Tonight, San Antonio police also investigating another shooting after a man was shot while sleeping in his bed. It happened around 430 this morning in the 100 block of West Hart Avenue. That's not far from South Flores and Division Avenue. Police say a 52 year old man was sleeping when he heard gunshots. One of those shots hit him right in the arm. He was taken to Bamsey and is expected to recover from his injuries. Officers are now investigating the incident as a possible drive by shooting. They say two homes were hit by bullets. No information available right now about the shooter. Tonight, a driver faces charges for a deadly wrong way crash in West Bear County. It happened around 1 this morning on Highway 90 West near State Highway 211. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says that Christopher James Davila was driving a pickup truck with two children inside. He was going the wrong way when he hit a sedan head on. The driver of that sedan died at the hospital. 
Babila and two children were taken to a hospital but are expected to be okay. Meanwhile, the sheriff's office says that Davila is facing several charges, including intoxication manslaughter. Happening around Texas today, members of the General Investigating Committee held a press conference about the impeachment proceedings against Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. State Representative Andrew Murr says the articles of impeachment have officially been delivered to the state Senate. The 12 representatives who will prosecute the case have also been named. This will now head to the Senate for a trial, but no date has been set yet. Two-thirds of the Senate would be needed to impeach Paxton. He is accused of bribery and corruption. Right now, his duties as Attorney General have been suspended until that trial in the Senate is complete. The Texas State Legislature, meanwhile, passing two bills yesterday that critics say amount to election meddling. The legislation argues or authorizes the Texas Secretary of State to order administrative oversight of a county elections office if a complaint is fired. Fired, filed, excuse me. Now, the measure would affect any county that has a population of more than 4 million people. And by the way, only Harris County in Houston meets that criteria. It's also a county that's leaned Democratic in recent elections. And now the bills are going to head to the governor's desk. Let's take a look at your Monday evening roadway conditions. They've become very wet here at I-10 and Medical and all across the northwest side. As those storms continue to hit, lots of rooster tails out there. Not a lot of traffic, but definitely wet out there. Give yourself some time. Mm -hmm. Now still ahead on the news at 6. Yes, this is the unofficial start to summer, but the start of the Atlantic hurricane season. That's just a few days away. Coming up what this year's hurricane forecast is looking like and also how you can stay prepared. All right, before we continue with our news at six, we're going to talk about the night beat. Uh, this is something that's become a growing trend, and experts say it may be here to stay. Tonight, why so many people are choosing to hold on to their old cars instead of buying new ones. Also, this has been a vital resource for children across South Texas who are suffering from mental health issues, and now they're moving out of their temporary facility and right into new housing. Tonight, how the Children's Bereavement Center plans to better serve the community from their new home. These stories and so much more tonight on The Night Beat. So you mentioned this before, this Thursday officially kicks off the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season. It's here again already. Meteorologist mm -hmm. Mia Montgomery takes a look at the forecast outlook for the season and what you can do at home to stay prepared. While this time of year often brings summer vacations and trips to the beach, it's also important to remember that hurricane season is approaching. The latest forecast outlook that was released by NOAA calls for a near normal season, while a second outlook from Colorado State University calls for a slightly below normal season. El Nino conditions are forecasted to take back over this summer, which have been known to correlate with less storms in the Atlantic Basin and Caribbean when compared to La Nina years, since wind shear is higher. However, scientists note that El Nino's influence on tropical activity could be offset by warmer than average ocean temperatures and more tropical waves coming off the coast of Africa, which often serve as a foundation for tropical cyclones to get up and running. And then as far as this year, um, El Nino versus the sea surface temperature, as I said, it's a pretty rare condition to have the, both of these going on at the same time. Regardless, it's important for those along and near coastal areas to always be prepared when this time of year rolls around. Even though San Antonio is a little ways inland, you can still stay prepared at home by having a kit ready that includes important items such as water, toiletries, non-perishable food items, a first aid kit, staying up to date with your insurance policies, and checking back in on the forecast regularly through the summer and fall months. It's time to prepare. Remember, it only takes one storm to devastate a community. Mia Montgomery, KSAT 12 News. And if you are interested, the official list of storm names has also been released, with the first three names being Arlene, Brett, and Cindy. Tim did not make the listing. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> All right, we're taking a live look outside right now. Uh, I-10 right there. Woo, you see there, not a single cloud in sight, looking super gray. We've been talking about storms. And uh, we, knew, we do know that some of the storms are weakening, Sarah. Yeah, the storms are weakening as they're moving through San Antonio, Stephanie and Tim, but they're still packing a punch. A lot of lightning, some torrential downpours for some folks. I do want to put your minds at ease. Other than some small 
piece sized hail. We are not concerned about that large damaging hail, so that is good news. But we are seeing very heavy rains right now falling over central San Antonio. So downtown San Antonio getting some heavy rain. Here's loop 410. Here's your proof that there is not a bubble over San Antonio. The heaviest of the rain is falling right now over San Antonio. We've got some heavy rain falling in northern Bear County as well. And anywhere you see these, I'm going to turn off the lightning here. Anywhere you see this purple color like out near China Grove, uh, just inside of 16, uh, 410 there rather, and just along 410 on the west side, that's where we could have some of that smaller pea-sized hail. We are seeing plenty of lightning and some very heavy rain falling as well. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn on the rainfall rates, which shows how hard the rain is falling. Anywhere you see this purple color, uh, like out near Castle Hills and on the west side uh, of San Antonio, that's where we're seeing rainfall rates of four to six inches an hour. That means if this storm was parked itself right over these areas for an hour, it would produce five inches of rain. It is, however, moving, but I do expect for us to see a quick one to two inches of rain in areas that have already not seen the rain, like areas from Shirts down to Somerset. Now, these storms are moving slowly to the southeast at about 20 miles per hour, so it could be near the Lavernia area by about 715. Southern Bear County getting this by seven o'clock and uh, Wilson County, Atascosa County getting it by about 720. Uh, this this evening. So something I want to show you is how much rain has already fallen in many areas around San Antonio. What we're going to do right now is we're going to look at the rainfall amounts from earlier uh, today. It's still raining. There's still some light rain over Kendall County and Northern Bear County, but anywhere you see this yellow color, that's two inches of rain. Two inches of rain has fallen over the rim. Two inches of rain has fallen in a swath across Kendall County up toward Comfort. And this bullseye here right to the east of Comfort, five inches of radar estimated rainfall. So when we look at uh, the warnings that are in effect, we do have a flash flood warning that has just been extended to to include downtown San Antonio until 930 this evening. So it's a big travel day out there. If you have plans to leave San Antonio tonight, wait until after this flash flood warning is expired at 930. We do expect uh, some flash flooding to begin around San Antonio here shortly. We'll be keeping an eye on things for you. Otherwise, we've got some storminess out toward Lakey and Concan, as well as south of Hondo, and we've got some isolated storms out near Hallettsville. Now these storms are fueled by daylight sunshine. So as we lose the sunshine and once the sun sets, we're going to see these rain uh, chances really fall off. And you can totally tell where the rain has been looking at the current clouds and temperatures. 60s across the hill country, still 80 degrees at JBSA Randolph and 86 in Pleasanton. So looking at tonight's forecast, again, after sunset at 830, the tap is going to turn off. It'll end up being mild and clear by about midnight. Now, what I want to show you right now is a look ahead to the forecast for tomorrow. It'll be much quieter tomorrow, 67 in the morning, right around 10. It'll be 75. We're going to have a mostly sunny day near 90 degrees for the high and looking ahead to the forecast for the remainder of the week. It'll be warm, quiet and humid with highs near 90 degrees. We do reintroduce rain chances by the end of the upcoming weekend. I'm continuing Continuing to keep an eye on the radar. I'll have more coming up in the next half hour. And for the record, you beat my phone while you were talking about the flash flood warning. I got the emergency alert right after you told us. There you go. That's why it's nice to have a live meteorologist. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Hi, how you doing? Hi, good, good. So last week we talked about baseball and softball, and it looks like much of the same today. It, it pretty much, exactly. And thankfully, DeHennis, one of the two teams that's heading to state, has already hit the road to avoid some of these flooding concerns. They're up in Austin as we speak. Canyon is on their way as well because they're undefeated. When we come back, we'll hear from them about advancing to state for the first time since 2019. Plus, TCU baseball got a boost from a local kid on their route to a Big 12 title. Got that too next. Have your dad in the stands and have him give you a shirt like this. What does that mean to you? Just to see him, his support around here. It's awesome, and um, and this shirt, what well, this shirt was made by Corpus Christi Ray. They thought they were going to beat us. Um, you see us right there.
Gage Goldberg and the Bernie Champion baseball team got a nice souvenir after taking down Corpus Christi Ray in the regional semifinals, but first. New Braunfels Canyon enters the final week of the high school softball season as one of 24 teams left standing, and all of them are now two wins away from a state title. The Cougarettes have made plenty of history in Austin. They're currently making their sixth all-time appearance at state and their first since 2019. But that means this current crop of players hasn't experienced right in Charlene McCombs Field yet. What kind of advice will head coach Kevin Randall give his team as they prepare? The first thing we tell them is this is a great accomplishment, but it's not over. The job's not over. We go back to work on Monday. We've got, we've got four more practices to get ready. Uh, the big thing is not just settling for this. And then the next thing we tell them is it's going to be really loud <laughs> and it's going to be really intense and it's going to be really fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Undefeated Canyon will take on Colleyville Heritage in the Class 5A state semifinals Friday afternoon at 1 p.m. The state championship game is Saturday at 1 p.m. The defending state champs have hit the road. This is the send-off that the Hennis softball team got this afternoon as they departed for Austin, where they've won two state titles over the last four years. The Cowgirls will open defense of their UIL Class 1A state title tomorrow at 10 a.m. against Natchez in the state semis. Should they advance, they would play in the state championship game at 1 p.m. on Wednesday. The regional final field has been set in high school baseball, and five teams from the greater San Antonio area have advanced to the fifth round. That includes the Johnson Jaguars, who came back to defeat Far San Juan Alamo in the three game Class 6A regional semifinal series last Friday. Next up, the Jags will face Westlake in the regional final. Game one of that series is this Thursday at Westlake High School. Bernie Champion is still riding high off a three game series victory over Corpus Christi Ray in the Class 5A regional semifinals over the weekend, and they carried that momentum into another best of three series against Leander Rouse for the regional title. Game one of that series is Thursday at Concordia University in Austin, but games two and three are both at the Wolf on Friday and Saturday. But before that, the Bernie Greyhounds will take over the Wolf on Thursday. Bernie needed all three games to defeat Robstown in the regional semis. Game one of the Greyhounds UIL Class 4A regional final series against Sinton is Thursday at 7 p.m. Games two and three would both be Friday if necessary at Whataburger Field in Corpus Christi. A former Greyhound helped TCU baseball claim the Big 12 title last night. Junior outfielder Luke Boyers clobbered a three-run homer in the top of the second. That was his seventh homer of the season, and it gave the Horn Frogs a 4-0 lead, and they went on to defeat Oklahoma State 12-5 to claim the tournament title. That gave TCU an automatic bid into the NCAA tournament, and the bracket was revealed this afternoon. The Horn Frogs are in the Fayetteville, Arkansas Regional and will open their tournament run against Arizona on Friday at 8 p.m. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Texas A&M enters the Stanford Regional and will take on Cal State Fullerton that same night at 9 p.m. It's nice to see who made it in. I know Texas made it in as well. I think the one thing that's going to be frustrating, UTSA, UTSA baseball sitting home with a better record than a lot of these teams that made the cut. All right. Thank you, Andrew. You got it. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. Memorial Day is when our nation pauses to reflect on the sacrifices made by the men and women of our armed forces. Laura Aguirre shows us how the nation honored its fallen heroes today. <laughs> those here and across the nation who are grieving the loss of a loved one who wore the uniform, our Gold Star families, to all those with loved ones still missing unaccounted for, I know how painful it can be. The president remembering all those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for our nation, part of the 155th National Memorial Day observance at Arlington National Cemetery Monday. We must never forget the price that was paid to protect our democracy. The president also laying a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Some of the country's last surviving World War II veterans were among those gathered at the memorial honoring their fallen comrades. The veterans placed wreaths in remembrance, escorted by soldiers and sailors of all military branches. A Joint Services Honor Guard led the ceremony at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall, inscribed with the names of over 58,000 service members who gave their lives in service of our country. We have only one truly sacred obligation, 
to prepare those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home and when they don't. I'm Laura Aguirre reporting. Now onto a scary scene in Florida over the weekend. Just look at this, a car right there plowing into the water on Saturday. How does that happen? Well, the Volusia County Sheriff's Office says the driver was speeding down the beach in Smyrna Dunes Park. The car got close to several families and their dogs, almost hitting a child. The driver, a 26-year-old woman, was in charge with a DUI and reckless driving. And thankfully, amazingly, nobody was hurt. The next step in raising the debt ceiling will happen tomorrow. That's when the House Rules Committee will consider the deal reached over the weekend by President Joe Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. The agreement would cut out spending and suspend the debt ceiling through January 1st of 2025. This will be a big test for the deal because some of the Republicans on the Rules Committee have been very critical of the agreement. If those Republicans vote against the deal, it would then fail unless some Democrats vote to advance the bill out of committee for a full House vote. I think at the end of the day, people can look together to be able to pass this in the House and the Senate together to sign it and send it to the president. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has warned if the U.S. can't borrow more money as soon as June 5th, we would no longer be able to pay our bills. Now, this Memorial Day weekend was one of the busiest travel holidays since before the pandemic, and the Transportation Safety Administration screened a record number of passengers at airports across the country. Yeah, while AAA estimated millions more hitting the roads to get to and from their holiday destination, ABC's Melissa Don shares the record-breaking travel from Los Angeles. Travel is back from the skies to the ground. The 2023 Memorial Day holiday weekend breaking travel records. TSA says they screened more than 2.7 million passengers at airports around the country Friday, making it the single busiest travel day since Thanksgiving of 2019. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg praising how the airlines and airports handled that rush as fewer than 1% of flights were canceled. But lines were long at airport security. ABC's Elwin Lopez monitoring them in Atlanta. The holiday scramble is on TSA lines stretching all the way into the atrium. Here in Atlanta, we could see more than 2 million passengers up until May 31st. So best advice is to arrive early to the airport and double check your bags for any prohibited items before getting to the security checkpoint. I'm still surprised by the line right now. I thought I'd be like two hours, I'd be okay, but I'm uh, kind of looking. That's kind of long, but I'll make it. For travelers hitting the roads, it's just as busy. AAA estimated 37 million people driving to and from their destinations this holiday weekend. I have a lot of travel plans for the summer and don't need to travel this weekend with all the hustle and bustle. The demand for travel is up. While AAA saw about 2 million more drivers on the road than last year, they are expecting an even busier summer of travel. Melissa Adon, ABC News, Los Angeles. All right, so we already have warm weather here, but you know, sunscreen is a great way to protect your skin. But here's the thing, you have to apply it correctly after the break, the sunscreen mistakes that you may be making and also how to fix them.